Well, thank you so much for having me. This is, I thought we were going to be 20 guys in the back of a bar talking about Twitter. So this is obviously a big shock to see this. So Chris Nixon assigned me this talk, The Essence of Critical Care. I'm a clinical speaker. This is touchy-feely stuff, but I'm going to do my best to try to discover the essence of critical care. So what is critical care? I agonize over this all the time. This is what I spend my free time doing when I'm not playing with my son, is thinking about what is critical care. And when I had to think about it for this lecture, what I came back to is a case when I was a first-year registrar. It was a 60-year-old woman, florid septic shock. She had already been put on 20 micrograms of dopamine. Couldn't even find a blood pressure with a non-invasive cuff. And she looked horrible. And I had just gotten through telling her husband that we're going to try to do everything we can to, to bring her back to him. And I went to my attending, my consultant, and said, what are we going to do? Her blood pressure's in the toilet. She's already at high doses of our first presser. We should put in an arterial line. We should start a second presser agent. And what he said to me is, she's been admitted to the ICU for an hour. This is their responsibility, not ours. This is their job, not ours. And what he said is that this is not the job of an emergency physician. This is the job of the intensivist. So I called up the ICU. We have this sick patient down here. She needs help. And they said, we have no beds yet, and it's your responsibility until she comes upstairs. So it's not the job of the intensivist. And the question I was left asking for the next few years is, whose job is it to take care of sick patients before they have a bed in the intensive care unit? And that question, I decided to make my niche in medicine. It just drove me insane to think that geography in the hospital would determine how a patient did. That if care that we feel is good and evidence-based upstairs in the ICU is what we think patients should get, they wouldn't get it until they got up there. And if they just happened to come in on a day where there was no ICU beds available, they would get a much lower level of care it didn't seem right. It didn't make any sense. And yet I felt I was banging my head against the wall. Why is no one else thinking this is not a good deal for our poor patients? And that's when I started conceptualizing the idea of upstairs care downstairs. That if it's good care there in the ICU, it should be the exact same care the patient receives from the moment they hit the door. It just makes sense. So a few years ago when I started the MCRIP podcast, that's what I dedicated myself to, is that concept of trying to bring good care from upstairs, downstairs, to the ED. And that's what the podcast is all about. Anyone listen to the MCRIP podcast? Uh, no, you guys are obviously smart EM listeners, because if you were an MCRIP listener, you'd make a lot more noise. Any MCRIP listeners here? <laughs> all right, now that, that's the people I love. Thank you all for listening. It's made my life in academic emergency medicine better than I ever could have imagined. Now, so we have great upstairs care downstairs, and if we're trying to accomplish it, that's, that's a good gig. But one of my friends in the ED said, sometimes we send patients up to the ICU, and they don't get good resuscitation. They don't get good care. Just because they're up in that unit doesn't necessarily mean they're getting the ideal care they should. Some intensivists get it, and some intensivists don't. And he said, why don't you start bringing upstairs care upstairs? <laughs> Well, that, that doesn't sound so good. Upstairs care everywhere? No, that, that doesn't have quite the same ring to it either. And I realized that words to describe this stuff actually do bear importance, that they actually matter, that how you describe these things, these mottos, these sayings about how you describe your work actually do matter. They're what sell it. The advertisers have known this forever, and yet we don't embrace that in the field of medicine, and we need to. So, when I was doing my linguistics training in undergrad, what I realized is, without a name, an idea doesn't truly exist. If you can't put it into words and make it simple, then no one's going to grasp it or do it. So I started thinking about this stuff a little bit more. And what you realize is, emergency medicine doctors, we're cowboys. We kind of shoot from the hip. We kind of have a very aggressive stance. Sometimes we don't think things through long term. But that's what you need when a sick patient first hits the door. And then you get your ICU guys. Right? Intensive. They're obsessive compulsive, they're anal, they're making sure every little checkbox is checked. And that's what you would want if you're in the ICU. But there's some middle ground where they overlap, where you take a sick patient, you need both. 
You need the shoot from the hip movement towards immediate aggressive care, and yet you also need to consider the long-term consequences. You need to consider what's going to happen from your actions, and you need to be anal. You need to go back and check everything again and again. And that overlap, that's critical care. That's the essence of critical care. Now, down here in Australia, you folks call this critical care, this overlap. In the States, we don't actually have a word for it. Critical care is synonymous with intensive care in the States. And there was no word to describe this concept of a doctor who could take care of a sick patient from both perspectives. And so we started co-opting the term resuscitation, which the post-arrest people owned for a long time, but which we want to make our own. So that's the overlap, is resuscitation. Now, just as an aside, when I was making these slides, I actually wanted some gender parity. You know, I have two men up there, and that's not right. So I did a Google search for cowgirl cartoon. <laughs> not safe for work. And if you put in anal retentive cowgirl cartoon, <laughs> whew, keep your kids away from the computer. So I got the cowboy up there. But resuscitation, this is what it's all about. And this is the words I now use to describe what I do in my specialty and what I want everyone in emergency medicine and critical care, intensive care, to be doing. And I started telling people that if you believe in this, if you think this is good, if you think patients deserve aggressive care that also factors in the long term, then you should call yourself a resuscitationist. Now, that's a, a new word. It sounds kind of bad, but it describes what I care about. You should call yourself a resuscitationist. Now, this is less important on the intensive care side, but in the States, on the emergency side, um, oh, and I should say that so a resuscitationist is essentially an obsessive-compulsive cowboy or cowgirl. Now, the reason this is so important to talk about in the States is emergency medicine in my country is moving in the opposite direction. They're taking on the role of primary care providers. And that's what they are optimizing, is a patient who doesn't have a family practice doc or a general practitioner. Come to the ED, we'll treat you. That's what we're optimizing, is the patient who doesn't have anywhere else to go for their primary care. And critical care is getting marginalized. And if you don't believe me, the example I give is I was at a conference a month ago in Houston, and a director of a major emergency department said, we shouldn't do critical care in the emergency department. Because if we treat those patients too well, the ICU will have no incentive to get them upstairs quickly. So essentially, what we're saying is, we'll mistreat our patients, we'll do the minimum possible, so the ICU thinks we're such bad doctors that we're going to kill those patients, and that will cause them to swoop down and take the patients upstairs quicker. When you're dealing with that mindset, you're already fighting a losing battle. And so I started telling people, don't call yourselves emergency physicians anymore. Say, my job is I'm an emergency physician and a resuscitationist. And every time you talk to people, add in and a resuscitationist so people know you're dedicated to both. You're dedicated to both caring for any patient that comes through the door, but understanding the priority is the sick patient that rolls through the door. So I came up with a new motto for the podcast and for what I do that I think is cleaner. And that's maximally aggressive care always. Maximally aggressive care always. And that means when we think the patient had a vibrant life before they came to us, maximally aggressive curative care. And when we have a patient that we don't feel these curative therapies are appropriate, maximally aggressive palliative care. They're two sides of the coin and you have to be equally aggressive for both. That's critical care. Maximally aggressive curative care, when we could send a patient back to their family to have a life. Maximally aggressive palliative care, when we could give them a good passage. Now, we bandied about words for about five, ten minutes now, but it's about more than words. Words are a really poor way to convey the concepts I want to get across. The way to do it when you talk to all of the presentation masters is stories. Stories are the way to present things, to get people to really believe in what you're saying. So let's talk about some stories. We'll talk about three of them. A retrieval story, an emergency department story, and an ICU story. Let's start off with the retrieval story. And it's a story of it had to happen. And this was a 39-year-old male in florid DKA. And the patient's looking sick enough, they decide to intubate. They use succinylcholine. A minute afterwards, the patient goes into ventricular fibrillation. So they do the ACLS and 
they actually lyse the patient, thinking this might be a, a myocardial infarction or a P, and the patient comes back, and they're feeling pretty good, but then the K comes back at 10.0, and the patient promptly arrests again, and they get the patient back and arrests again. And this was a small hospital here in Australia, so they called for a retrieval team, get the patient to an ICU, thinking maybe they need a cath lab, but they certainly need more than the small hospital has to offer. They had treated the patient for the hyperkalemia at this point when the retrieval team arrived with a retrieval doctor leading the team. And the retrieval doctor, when he came to the foot of the bed, found a patient looking horrible. Wide complex bradycardia. And soon after the arrival, the patient codes again. And so they work the patient another round of hyperkalemia therapies, bring the patient back, and again, he codes. Bring him back, again, he codes. Now, at this point, I'd be out of things to do. I, I would say, well, we have to keep going, but this is probably not going to end well. There was no dialysis in the hospital, not even a dialysis machine. And what this retrieval the doc decided to do from a discussion he remembered from his days as a registrar is to emergently, during cardiac arrest, place a peritoneal dialysis catheter and dialyze the patient. Found a surgical registrar walking by, brought him to the bedside, though fully prepared to do it if he couldn't find that surgical registrar. Talked to his team and said, are you okay with this? This is out of the ordinary. I'll take full responsibility, but I want to make sure you're okay. And they all were. And they put in the peritoneal dialysis fluid while the patient was still coding. The patient came back. Complex narrowed. The patient got to ICU. Let's hear it in the words of the actual this doctor involved. This was a young involved. man who deserved for us to try everything that, that could be done to save him. And there was something that I thought could help. And I had no right to deny him that option. If we could make it happen, we should make it happen. And I asked the team if they were comfortable to proceed with the procedure. Everybody said yes. So to me, it had to happen. And in my mind, it had already happened. And had the surgical registrar not been available to put the catheter in, I would have done it. It had to happen. That's Cliff Reed, who you'll hear from shortly. And when we, in the question and answer period, ask Cliff about the conversation he had with the nephrologist about this case. I think you'll find it very amusing. But that, that just kept sticking in my mind when I talked to Cliff about this. In my mind, it had already happened. And you'll hear more about that in Cliff's lecture. So that's the retrieval story. Let's talk about the emergency story. There was unfinished business. A 50-year-old male comes into the emergency department with belly pain, and almost instantly upon arriving, goes into cardiac arrest. They perform ACLS, and they actually get the patient back. They throw on the ultrasound probe to try to figure out the etiology of the arrest, and this is what they find, an enormous AAA. They call down vascular, and the vascular attending arrives at the bedside, and the patient's not looking good. Obviously, has to be rushed to the OR. But before they could even move him, the patient codes again. And the emergency doctor turns to the vascular surgeon and says, we have to do something. This is a young man. He came in yesterday. You know, he was perfect yesterday. Today he comes in. We have to do something. Let's, let's open his chest. And the vascular attending says, no. He's already coded twice. He can't do anything here. We just have to let him go. That's not critical care. And despite having the vascular attending next to him, the emergency doctor decided against the advice of the vascular attending to proceed with a thoracotomy. He told his registrar, cut, get in there. They clamped the aorta at the level of the diaphragm, pumped in blood, and got the patient back. The patient went to the operating room, had his AAA repaired, and walked out of the hospital with completely intact neurological status back to his family. That's critical care. Let's hear it from the doctors involved. What was I thinking at the moment the vascular surgeon said, just call it? Uh, I think I was thinking that, I, that there was unfinished business. I think I, was, I felt like, you know, I had a, a mission in mind, which was to get this guy back, do everything we could for him, because uh, he seemed very survivable. It seemed like just an acute catastrophe. And despite, you know, my leanings, which tend to be minimalist, um, I definitely felt like the job was unfinished and there was work to be done. That's the voice of David Newman of Smart EM, a, a very popular podcast on evidence-based emergency medicine. He was the attending 
the registrar who actually did the thoracotomy was Ashley Shreves. She's also on Smart EM. He married her, and I'm, I'm fully with that. If you find a registrar that could cut into the chest and clamp the aorta, you, you scoop that one up. The last story I have for you, this girl is not going to die. And this was a case I was involved in as a fellow. This was an 18-year-old girl who was just joyriding in the back of a golf cart with friends and fell out, hit her head. Her only injury was a traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage. And we thought she'd do okay. But very soon afterwards, developed florid neurogenic pulmonary edema and then neurogenic cardiogenic shock. And this was one of the sickest patients I ever treated. And her ventilator status was so bad, she was on APRV 40 over zero, and even that was barely ventilating her. Her ICPs were intractable. We actually stood her up in a striker frame to reduce her ICP. She got a, uh, a laparotomy and an open belly to reduce her intracranial pressure, and still, intractable ICPs, horrible lung function, horrible heart function. And so as we always did at my place of training, the Shock Trauma Center, we went to my hero, Thomas Scalia, the physician-in-chief, because we were, had run out of options. And let's hear it from him. And, you know, we're kind of out of juice. We've, lost, we, we've burned all our magic. You know, this is the literal truth. I went in the office and said, this girl is not going to die. I sat there a long time. And finally, the light bulb went on. Because I said, you know, if we didn't have to have her on 40 over zero, we could drop her ventilator, then her ICP would come down. We cannulate her and go on ECMO. And we had to, um, to put the, the jugular cannula in, we had to climb up on a ladder because she was high enough up to cut down on her neck. And we put her on ECMO and we turned the ventilator off. She turned down Princeton to go to Vanderbilt and I'll do anything to recruit a nurse practitioner. I just hired her. She finished nurse practitioner school, and I just hired her to come back and work for us. N equals one. That's a pretty cool N. I still get choked up when I listen to him. There she is, fully intact. That's them standing up and putting the ECMO catheters on. There she is, on ECMO standing up, open belly. They did the trach standing up as well. And so what we realize from these stories is that people are the essence of critical care. And not just emergency doctors, not just intensivists. The interventional radiologist that's willing to come in and take care of your pelvic trauma, they're critical care. The GI doctor that doesn't say, oh no, this patient's too sick. The anesthetist that realizes no, we shouldn't scrub the case. The operating room is actually a one-on-one -on -one critical care unit for the sick patients. And it's not just doctors. It's the medics. And, I mean, more than anything else, it's nursing. Without them, there is no critical care. Are there any nurses in the audience? Yeah, can we have a round of applause for the nurses? <laughs> yeah. So people are critical care. That's the essence. We can take care of sick patients. That's what we do. That's what we like to do. That's what we're trained to do. And that's what we're paid to do. And I think that the rest of medicine is paid to amuse themselves. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't say amuse themselves when you talk to him in person, though. <laughs> that's Peter Rosen, one of the founders of emergency medicine. He knew what critical care was. That's what he envisioned for our specialty. Critical care is taking care of sick patients. That's what it's about. And anyone who does that is critical care. And so everyone in this audience is critical care. We are critical care. We save lives. We relieve suffering. Why do we do that? Help me out here. Because we are? Oh, come on. You're radiologists like that. Because we are? We provide good deaths. Why? Okay. Hell yeah. And then we tell the patient's family, their wives, their husbands, their children, we take in their grief and we then sublimate it and go home to our own families, our own spouses, our own children. And we love them. And we love them all the harder because we know more than anyone that life is fleeting. 
and we need to value every moment. Why? Come on. <laughs> yeah. We cure and comfort. Why? <laughs> we fight it and we sweat. Why do we do this? Why do we do this? We are critical care. We are so lucky to be in critical care because we don't have to justify our profession. What we do, its benefit is obvious. We take care of sick patients. Our only natural enemy is the hospital administrator. <laughs> so what is critical care? We are critical care. And with that, welcome to SMAC 2013.